Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we're talking rice and its global market. Rice makes up to 20% of the world's dietary energy supply and as such is crucial to global food security and to the nations that produce it. Most of it is consumed domestically, leaving a small illiquid global market which is highly volatile as a result of government interventions, weather events and so forth. However, as global populations grow, and food taste change, rice is expected to grow as a global crop. What's the market for rice? What's its structure? And what's its future in a more deglobalized and environmentally volatile world? Our guests are Lewis Williamson and Marvin Coleman, both managing directors and regional co-heads of commodity sales and trading at HCS to Commodities, a division of Hilltop Securities, the investment bank. HTS Commodities is a leading player in the rice markets. As always, please do leave a positive review on the platform you're listening on. It really helps broaden the audience of the show and continue to allow us to get great guests on. And as always, I hope you enjoy the episode. Marvin, Lewis, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Paul. We're glad to be here, Paul. So I'm, I'm excited to have this conversation. You know, we're talking rice, we're talking the global rice market. And rice, given its huge impact and consumption on, on in world food, is kind of a bit of an esoteric topic in the commodities world, simply for the fact, as we're going to discover, it's it's not sort of it doesn't follow the same similar commodities in how actively traded it is and and how open the market is. But I think we need to sort of start uh, right at first principles. Lewis, can you just help frame up the basics when it comes to rice? You know, what is it? Where is it produced? How is it processed? And 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 what is the state of sort of the you know the the, the overall rice sector? Paul, I'm glad to. I, I would say this to, to start with. Let's all remember rice and wheat are truly the lifeblood of humanity. Let's look back over time. You see the value of that to the world populations as we move forward, and our population continues to expand worldwide, as does consumption. I can tell you, at least in the last five years, I do not think there could have been a better day for you to call us to discuss rice. There have been major announcements overnight that have, are impacting this market today and will impact us it appears as we move forward and a, the big announcement overnight is india announced that they may put restrictions on non-basmati rice so what does that mean well first of all india makes up 40 percent of the world export market We've seen India put restrictions on exports before. We've seen it in sugar and wheat recently. And now they're talking about rice, and that's the non-Basmati rice. Uh, China and India, your two largest producers. It's kind of sobering to think about this, Paul, but the U.S. only produces about 1% of world production. I'd point out to you that in we were concerned about El Nino and what the impact may be. In India so far, I'm not seeing a big issue with that, but we're seeing real inflation in India and specifically food inflation. And let's just go back and kind of look at what's going on. In Delhi this year, price of rice is up 15%. On a worldwide basis, ending stocks are continue to drop on a worldwide basis. Things are tight, certainly here in the U.S. When you look at what's going on here in the in the U.S., they're very, very tight for old crop. Harvest is just beginning in South Texas and Louisiana as we speak. And when I look at today's news in rice for the U.S. domestic market and the futures market, receipts have dropped down to, to just five receipts. I believe that's the tightest I've seen in, in at least five or six years. And so they should be virtually at, at zero, if you will. Open interest in rice, we're a little bit above 8,500. I look for that to grow as we see more consumers step forward. We look at world markets today and many people have pulled back, Paul, on the export quotes as following this announcement by India. So I think that's all important. And one thing that Paul, we, we spoke about when we met back in March, certainly the Weather will be a factor. It's been a factor worldwide this year as we go into an El Nino situation. 
we're really going to want to watch the Gulf of Mexico as harvest begins in South Louisiana and South Texas. Uh, heaven forbid if we had a hurricane come up through Central Louisiana and what the implications would that, that be for, for harvest of both Louisiana crop and Arkansas crop. We grow a tremendous amount of rice in this area, and it is kind of sobering to, when you look at the numbers to, to realize that we are only producing 1% of worldwide production. It's big to us here. It's certainly big in the when we're at players in the market. So it's an interesting scenario. So I hope that gives you some type of idea on what we're seeing today and why I make that comment that this is such an interesting day to visit. And we did see sharply higher markets today, I would point out. And I guess this is, it comes back to this theme that's threading through the podcast of deglobalization, security of supply, and obviously the climate impacts as well. You've had sort of this doomsday scenarios of multiple failed harvest potentially. So in order to get kind of to the, I think you've set out how how sort of important this is and, and, and as a function of actually sort of how sort of illiquid it can be in terms of open trades, how sort of little known it is. Maybe, Marvin, we can sort of work back from there so that we can get the foundations in place to come up to why India is banning exports. How much of, of global food is rice? You know, what are the varieties that are produced? And, and just at a basic level, how is it harvested and processed? And when we talk about trading rice, what form is that rice in? Rice is produced across the globe. Foundationally, rice is planted in the springtime. Rice grows in water primarily, shallowly flooded rice fields or rice paddies, and grows throughout the summer, harvested in the fall. And when the rice is harvested via mechanical means, combines here in the United States, it is in the form of rough rice. It comes out of the field, goes into a grain bin, or goes to a storage elevator. And that is in the form of rough rice. It has a husk on it. Rough rice is then processed, either sold via rough rice, traded via rough rice, or processed into milled rice. And once the husk or the outer layer of the seed is taken off via the milling process, that is brown rice. That leaves the bran layer on it. So that's the brown rice that uh, has the higher uh, health benefits, nutritionally speaking, nutritional benefits. And then that's further polished into uh, when you remove the bran layer, that removes the bran layer via the milling process, which turns it into polished or milled rice. Great. And and where is it? So it's predominantly, we've already said it's only 1% is produced in the United States. It's predominantly produced in Asia, in, in sort of in the tropics. Can you just give us some sense of its importance to world food, but also the the structure of the market? Because it is very illiquid from an open market standpoint. Yes, it is, Paul. You're exactly right. Most rice that is produced across the globe is consumed domestically. There's only a very small percentage of rice that is produced that is meant for export channels. And India, China, Indonesia, Vietnam, those are your largest producers across the globe. When it comes to sort of international trade, how is that primarily done, you know, where there is there is export going on? Is this all bilaterally done, etc.? Paul, there is government to government transactions, purchasing and selling government to government, but oftentimes it is uh, private corporate exports that go out on the global market. And that is handled by private exporters and oftentimes does go to government entities, but oftentimes it's it's private exporter to private importer. Yeah, so so bilateral trades. And then but there is this sort of seven percent that's kind of what we would see as a sort of traditional sort of open commodity market. I mean that's a very small percentage. How does that market operate and and, and is that where the sort of the, the futures kick in? Yes, the obviously 7% is a very small percentage on the global export trade. And yeah, so the futures market in the United States is has been around a long time. Since the early 80s, the futures market moved to the Chicago Board of Trade, which is where it still is housed through the CME group. That's where price discovery is 
is handled via the market participants. Most rice is domestically consumed. It's obviously of critical political importance, right? These are, these are nations securing their own food supplies. Who else is involved in this? I mean, who are the major players when we t- think about exporters in, in terms of companies? I mean, how... Because rice just feels quite different. When we talk about wheat or we talk about grains, we can talk about the big four. You know, you've got very transparent markets, very efficient markets, little government involvement. But then you talk about rice and suddenly we're sort of in very much, it's government to government, as as Marvin was saying. How did rice become like that? Why is rice like that? And and where does private enterprise come in? Well, it's, it's such a major cereal grain for the world consumer. And um, quite a few of your poor nations depend on rice as their, as their staple. So not only do we, do we see sales, but you also see some direct support from the U.S. government and the different agencies to help feed those nations. You'll see that in, certainly in, in Africa and other in, the, in the, some of the Caribbean nations. When there's a, an issue, we're sending in rice and you'll see it bagged. And it's, it's U.S. rice. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's really what it is. When you, like I said early on, wheat and rice are the the lifeblood of humanity, and that's it's a big, big market worldwide. And and okay, thanks for that. And is this market so obviously it's growing as a result of of population growth? Although you know, there's a different story potentially there in China versus India. And are also Western Western nations consuming more rice as well as as trends and fashions and and health health applications change as well? I mean, where are we at in demand for rice? Because I think this is going to play into obviously capacity concerns around climate, etc. When you continue to see our world population expanding, and we're where are we today? Seven and a half billion people. Then there's certainly more mouths to feed and. That's the base for many diets. Here in the U.S., just go to the grocery store and look at the finished products that you see, and you can name numerous off, off the top of your head that use rice uh, for that value-added production, if you will. So when you go there, you'll see a, a product that you can open is already flavored, et cetera. As you see more and more of that, the U.S. consumer loves that product. And we continue to see growth in that space here domestically. And Marvin, it'd be great to get sort of your take and perhaps also as well help anchor us in the prices of rice and, and what's happened over the last decade and how even rice is priced. I mean, what's the basic unit of rice and yeah, where are those prices going? So rice is traded globally per metric ton, 2,204.623 pounds per metric ton. That's how rice is traded globally. Domestically, the futures market trades in 200,000 pound increments. It's traded in hundred weights, dollars and cents per hundred weight. Currently, the September futures contract is $15 and some cents per hundred weight. And that's how rice is priced. It's traded per metric ton. And we get a weekly report from the U.S. government that shows how much rice was exported or sold and shipped out of the United States and that's all traded in per metric ton. And and where have can you just give us a, a sort of a potted history of the last decade in terms of prices as well? I mean, you know, have we did rice follow the other commodities in a long period of stable prices, low prices, low inflation, and then we've suddenly seen a spike alongside the others in, in the pandemic or in the wake of the pandemic? Yes, Paul. Price of rice uh, is highly, highly influenced by supply and demand trends like any other commodity. And in 2008, we had a critical situation, and it was also related to uh, rice exports uh, and bans on exports. And so when you see that, historically, you see uh, very significant volatility in the price of rice. And so in 2008, rice went to an all-time high, $25 and some some odd cents per hundred weight. And then you get the response. It takes a couple of years to work through a challenging situation, but you get the response of higher production, Paul, uh, which softens prices. And so there is a cyclical nature to it. For several years after making a $25 all-time high back in 08, rice prices went down 
and traded, you know, down to ten, twelve dollars, um, that sort of range. And then just over time, uh, in the last decade, it's been a, a pretty significant rebound. Obviously, following supply and demand trends, but then just recently, we've had uh, lower production in the United States. Uh, these are U.S. prices I'm talking about. Lower production in the United States and uh, firmer prices uh, in spite of a of an increasing and strengthening dollar on the U.S. interest rate policy. Higher prices. So that's that's sort of the pattern that we have that we have seen just in the recent history. Mm. Is the U.S. sort of the swing producer, <laughs> you know, kind of like its role in oil when it comes to rice, or is that one percent just ultimately relatively insignificant in the overall pricing of rice globally? Well, I would say, Paul, that our rice price is heavily influenced by the prices in uh, Thailand and Vietnam and India. I mean, those are those are prices you can take China out of the picture because they consume basically all that they that they grow. And they're not really a, a, an influencer in the world price, but uh, Thailand, Vietnam, India, those are very significant. So we take a clue from what, what from what those prices are doing. But uh, we are a very it is very significant agriculture market here in the United States. Although it's very small, uh, it is very significant, very important, very strong, thriving industry here domestically. Mm. And why is it? And I know, obviously, we're going to talk about Hilltop Securities and your role in it across, you know, you're integrated right across the, the, the value chain there. But just talking more broadly, why is, I mean, rice is quite a specialized trading activity, right? Why haven't we seen, or maybe I'm just ignorant of this, why, why don't we see it dominated similarly like we do in other grains by the big four ag houses, you know, the ADMs, the Bungies, the Cargills and Dreyfuses? That's a great question, Paul. I would say part of it is that these other big markets, your corn, your beans, your wheat, have been around for many decades, if not over 100 years. And rice is a relatively younger contract. Like I mentioned, it, it started in the uh, early 80s down in New Orleans and moved to the Chicago border trade, the contract moved to Chicago border trade. So I think that's part of it. Part of it is the very small percentage of production that is actually exported versus consumed domestically. I think that has an impact on it as well. And then I think education. I think that's important. What Lewis and I try to do is, you know, educate as many people as possible about the benefits and um, opportunities for hedging that rice uh, futures and options bring. I think that more people need to be educated about it, about it, about the contract. Is that contract used for hedging via these governmental bodies in China, India, you know, and the other big, you know, private exporters? Do we, do we have any insight on that? Paul, I would say historically there has been a small percentage of the futures market here in the United States that is traded via overseas participants. Percentage-wise, I don't have a good handle on exactly what that is, but yes, there is overseas participants in our markets. Lewis, you want to chime in? I did want to chime in. You were asking why we don't trade more volume in, in rice than we do. I think it's, you know, to me, it's rather simple. I look at the acreage that's planted in the U.S. We're going to have 83 million plus acres of beans, 94 million acres plus of corn, you know, 49 million acres plus. And you get to rice and we're at 2.5 million acres. So it's a much smaller market from a production standpoint. But when you look at it from a consumer standpoint, I, if you're having a cold beer this afternoon, most likely it it has uh, rice in it. If you're most likely with your dinner, you may very well be having a rice product tonight. So it's it's critical in our supply chain and the food chain production chain here in the U.S. to have that. But it is a rather small market from acreage standpoint. The HC Insider podcast is brought to you by HC Group, a retained search intelligence and advisory firm focused solely on the global energy and commodity sector. With six locations across Asia, Europe and the Americas and over 50 consultants. To find out more, go to our website, hcgroup.global.
There, you can also sign up for our HC Insider content for more interviews and white papers on relevant trends and talent impacts in the commodities world. Okay, so let's let's advance. Thanks for that. I think you know you've given us a good overlay of, 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 the, of the, the space. Again, I think it's relatively unfamiliar, certainly to myself. But it seems to me like it is, as we've sort of highlighted again and again now, it's critical to world food and obviously critical to many Southeast Asian nations and so forth. And it's and it's a big um, political topic there where you, you've got to be able to feed the population. You, you started off the topic, um, Lewis, talking about India banning exports. It sounds like rice is even more, in, in inverted quotes, political than oil in that sense. Where does rice sit at the moment in terms of we're seeing this trend of deglobalization? You've got free trade sort of on the back foot, if you'd like, and a lot of interventions going on at all levels uh, by all governments to secure food or energy or whatever it might be. Can you just help contextualize how rice is, is actually a a hot potato in political terms and what led to the Indian government coming out with the export controls? Absolutely, Paul. Uh, first of all, I'd say from an Indian standpoint, it is being driven, if in fact they put that into place, uh, by concerns over food inflation. Like I said earlier, the you look at Delhi uh, prices in Delhi, uh, the consumer, they're up 15, 15% this year. There's a real food security issue worldwide. You see that discussed in, in many nations. When you look at the consumption, 90% of the world rice consumption is over in, in Asia. And so that's a big, big, that's a big, big market for uh, the exports of rice. And Mart, I know you want to come in on that too, but that's the way I see it. Yeah, Martin, please comment. And also, I think more broadly, like, when it comes to sort of domestic policy, I assume that this is front and center to the Chinese Communist Party, to uh, Prime Minister of Indonesia, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. I mean, rice, obviously, as as arguably the second most uh, critical food cereal grain in the world, it is in the crosshairs. I mean, all of these countries with a lot of mouths to feed are focused on governmental policies and focused on production and focused on imports uh, to make sure that their mouths are fed. Prices of rice in in India have risen probably to a two-year high. Concerns on El Nino and the impact that El Nino may or may not have on production is important. So these countries are making sure, first and foremost, priority, price is no factor when they need to feed their people. They will do what it takes to make sure that their food security needs are handled securely. I mean, it must be playing, you know, 4D chess, right, with uh, the U.S. market, for example, where you've got you've got so many other factors that could play into this and create volatility, right? When, when you're sort of at the fiat whim of, of these nations who are the largest producers, is, is that a fair statement, Lewis? Well, let's face it, Paul, you know, you, you look at it and uh, the importance of both wheat and rice in feeding the world. And in many cases, the world's poor, any politician, any government knows the real issue or, or the real scare of having a hungry voting population, and you know, look at the look at the tremendous efforts in Egypt to secure wheat and the credit that is given to them, and they're the largest wheat importer in the world. You've got the same thing in rice. You have to have that food supply coming in to feed those people, and it's important. You've got to do that from a you know, keeping your your population restful. Yeah, and I, but I assume that means, that, like, like you were talking about in 2008, Marvin, I mean, this adds an, an, another level of volatility and price risk management challenges when you, you can have these sudden shifts in policy. I'm just sort of, you know, compared to perhaps a more sort of transparent market, whether it's sort of like domestic gas and power or whatever it might be, even oil, you know, or sort of, uh, it's, it, I assume it's less politically volatile than what, what you can see in rice. Well, Paul, you're exactly right. And... If we think about global governmental entities, if there is an election at hand or in the near future, 
as Lewis mentioned, stability of the people, stability and assurances of food supplies are very important. And for governments that are seated currently, they want to make sure that they've got plenty of opportunity to uh, you know, control food price inflation if possible so that they are able to maintain their control on the government. Yeah. And in the backdrop of this, the other source of major volatility for rice, which is a, a more sensitive crop in the sense of the growing conditions that it needs, is obviously climate and climate change, climate variability, but also you know, an El Nino, obviously, we're talking about here. Can you just help us understand, I mean, how sensitive is rice to weather and climate changes? And how much does that factor in? I mean, what's can that have a devastating impact on crop yields and conversely, a you know, huge boosted yields in any given year? It can have a significant impact. I tell you what rice likes. Rice likes good growing conditions, and that's warm to not very hot, but warm to hot, but yet cooler nights as the plant is filling the seed heads and pollination and maturing the seed head. If rice gets stays too warm in the overnight hours, and we're going to say 75, 77, 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit overnight, that does have an impact on the quality of the rice and, and also has somewhat of an impact on the yield as well. So those are concerns. So that's there's variability. Genetics, yes, genetics are great and they're getting better. And there's some wonderful companies out there domestically and globally that are working very hard to help solve supply problems for the uh, for the most needy uh, countries out there. But yeah, rice is uh, very sensitive. It must grow either in water or be at least watered periodically. And that's the two different types of rice grown here in the United States. One of them is row rice, which is simply irrigated or watered periodically, and also flood rice or paddy rice, which grows in shallow water, which is what most rice around the world, uh, how it's grown. Yeah, perfect. And is there, I mean, what about the role of disease? I mean, is that a, a prevalent factor in, in rice growth? Because I, I did read, obviously, that paddy rice, you do actually, that's a that's a really efficient way of killing off pests and, and other diseases that might t- take on the crop. Mm-hmm. That's right. So, yes, there is more, and, and we're just hearing that now here in the United States, Paul, a little bit, uh, that there's some weedy rice, weedy weeds growing up in it. But typically, when you grow rice in a paddy, in a rice field, flooded in a paddy, that eliminates a lot of the pressures that you would see from other plants that may want to uh, compete with rice. So um, that that's helpful. But yeah, there are, you know, certain, uh, there are lots of chemicals out there or uh, herbicides that are able to be sprayed safely on the rice to eliminate some of these threats to the health of the plant. Yeah. Okay, Lewis, before we sort of move on to Hilltop and, and your involvement, so today, as we stand in this market, you've highlighted this is sort of one of those sort of pivotal moments. You've got huge volatility driven by political decisions and the need for food security, etc. And you, against the backdrop of just an ever-growing demand for rice, not just in Asia, but also in the West. When you look forward, is rice in for a volatile decade as we do see more and more sort of blocks created internationally and deglobalization and obviously inflation and population pressures taking their toll and and you know a, a changing environment what do you see in terms of the the next decade as it holds for the global rice market i think you're hitting the nail on the head and that is uh, stability of these nations and how do you keep the nations stable you need to keep, keep them fed and that will control much of your your unrest we see that across the, the world today. Every morning you turn on the television, you see the unrest that's developed somewhere. Much of that is being driven by unrest within their uh, population. And it may be food because of lack of the food, or it may be political in nature. But I, I think that will continue to grow. I think when you look at the U.S., 
that when you look at the food companies and what they're doing today, the uh, research and development that is going into uh, further processing of rice, I think you'll see that market grow here, certainly uh, domestically speaking. So I'm, I'm quite positive on the demand side of rice as we move into the next decade. Yeah, Marvin, any thoughts? Yeah, I would agree. I, I would say that globalization is certainly helping with stabilization. I mean, you have, you're going to have flare-ups. You know, there's no assurance that weather's going to be ideal every year all across the globe. Somewhere there's going to have a weather problem. So rice is heavily influenced by supply and demand. It takes a few years to work through the supplies and the demands to smooth out the course. But yeah, I would say that uh, certainly genetics are an important role that uh, has helped with the yields. And um, yeah, we're just we're optimistic about uh, about the the market moving forward. Do you see domestic U.S. production going up, and therefore, consequently, do you see more of the larger sort of ag houses playing a role in the market or getting into it? I mean, what do you see on the, the market trajectory? Yeah, Paul, with the demand trends that we're seeing, higher Indian prices smaller crops based on weather patterns out of South America, and early, larger acreage here in the United States, early planted, larger acreage in the United States for the 2023 crop year, we do see more participants. And as you see more demand, more open interest, more trading, you're going to have more participants and a, certainly with volatility. Anytime you see volatility, you're going to have non-traditional players. There are funds, there's markets made up of commercials, speculators, little traders, large traders, uh, but you're going to see more and more participants as this crop size gets larger. You have naturally more trading by the major ag houses or commercials. And so, yeah, that just naturally feeds upon itself into into more interest and more opportunity. But there aren't, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, there aren't many rice traders, you know, individuals, are there? I mean, there's re this is a very unique and well, relatively rare skill set, I should say, just in terms of the number of people in the market who have sort of the deep expertise. I mean, it's not like a hedge fund's going to be able to find a plethora of rice traders to pick up to build desks with. Uh, that's exactly right. There are very few of us out there. But yeah, you, you're not going to find very many people that trade significant, uh, you know, rice positions, but there are those out there. And um, it's important to those who are in the business or in the in the space, in the in the investment space in agriculture. Yeah. Well, Lewis, it'd be great to turn to you. And actually, I guess from a Hilltop Securities lens, why is your role so important? And indeed, what sort of functions and services do you provide to the sector? Paul, oh, I, I really feel like that we're in a unique situation and that we're involved with the whole supply chain of rice, whether that be from the seed companies, and we work heavily in that space, to the grain elevators, to the rice miller, to the exporter, and very importantly, I'd say the, the uh, finished product groups out there we work with. And so, like I said, when you go to the store, you'll see the different types of rice that you can buy. Uh, and many have been further processed where you add water or whatever it may be, and it's a flavored type rice. I see that growing, but we're involved up the, the whole chain here. We're heavily involved in futures and options and managing risk for these companies because risk, I can tell you, is significant in the rice market. You can see this market really move, and uh, we may very well be on the verge of that now if, in fact, that the Indian situation were to come to fruition. Yeah, yeah. And and just just I mean for my edification as much as our audience when you when you're talking to the typical rice producer or sort of the you know the food companies how much education is needed in terms of risk management processes and and so forth to that community because I mean you've got we just had um Scott Irwin on talking about so sort of the ag futures space grains futures that's a very sophisticated, you know, your average farmer is playing the market and very, very sophisticated when it comes to their own risk management or there's lots of services out there. It's heavily broked. Is that the same in rice or is this a different sort of level of education and engagement needed to be able to start building these, these services up? Same principle, Paul, on trading the major grain, same principle. 
but this is a niche market in the United States and it takes someone with decades of experience following the rice market. That's where you really have to focus on. Chime in on that too, Marvin. I, I, I think you're exactly right. The producer, I think in many situations, he's guilty of looking at his back window and seeing what's going on with rice there instead of looking at the total domestic situation and total international position. Most of the people that we see on the commercial end of this market have been in the business for a while and they understand what drives this market. And uh, you really have to use kid gloves and uh, trading this market. Paul, you don't want to go in there and buy a couple of hundred lots at the market like you can in, in corn or beans or wheat and, and rice. If you trade a couple of hundred contracts at the market, you blow the market up. So you have to be very careful in the way you place orders. Our, our team is well experienced in that. We're, we do that every day, all day long. We're involved in all these other markets, don't get it wrong. But when we're trading rice, we're very focused about how we place our orders and our clients are very focused on how they want them placed. And so we're out there trying to do the very best we can and getting good fills for the customer and to shed light on what's driving these markets. Yeah, fascinating. And if I ask you both, because again, you know, some episodes I feel like, you know, I've been involved in those markets for a long time and know, you know, know the community at the very least, right? This this is very, very new to me in some senses. But when you when you look at the rice market today, maybe I can get a prediction of of each of you. Where do you think we'll be in a decade? Are you, do you think that consumption has gone up? Do you think that we'll, we're going to experience a very volatile year? I mean, what, what sort of, if you had to pick one or two things you think might drive the next decade in rice, what would they be? Maybe, Marvin, you, you can kick us off. Well, Paul, uh, that's a big question. <laughs> it's a big question. I do know that. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yeah, if I was that smart, we may not have to be talking, but... Uh... <laughs> I would say, you know, it's difficult to project, hey, uh, you know, short term versus 10 years. But uh, if we're talking about a decade out, I mean, look, we've been trading this market a long time and there are cycles in everything. Life cycles, time cycles, biological cycles, investment cycles, um, ag cycles. So to me, Paul, uh, I would say that rice is here. It, it's been around and it's going to be here. And I would expect that open interest uh, with the right education, with more education, more participants, that rice would be uh, thriving and growing. And price-wise, it's hard to say because we're at historically high levels right now. If you look at the charts, these are high levels historically. So with, are they going to be lower or higher? That's difficult to say. Typically, over time, prices go up, but they can go sideways for a number of years, Paul. So that's kind of a, a small glimpse, but I would say that uh, I'm optimistic. I want everybody to be successful. I want the, uh, you know, from the, the vertically integrated, I want, uh, you know, the producer to be successful and the buyer and the consumer and the exporter. Uh, I want the whole market to be successful because if, if they're successful, then the strength of the contract is going to just continue to uh, garner more interest over time. Fantastic. Lewis, any, any final thoughts? I would say I, I'd echo some of the things Marvin said. I'm, I'm sort of very positive on demand from a worldwide standpoint, but the population of the world is growing and continue to grow. We'll have more mouths to feed. You uh, have more money being made out there, more people going from uh, poverty in the middle of class. And that tells me they'll, they'll continue to raise their, their dietary uh, consumption, which will include rice. So I see that. I think the wild card is uh, what do we see from a genetic standpoint? Some of the seed companies we're working with today, I can tell you, are doing significant research on genetics of how do you how do you increase your yield per acre? And so I think that's important. I think one of the concerns that I see is from an environmental standpoint and the usage of water. Do we see any restrictions coming from the U.S. government on the amount of water that we use to grow rice, which happens to be significant? Something like that, could that be a, uh, come up as a factor? Absolutely, it could. But uh, yeah, I'm, very, I'm very positive on it. I'm like Marvin. I, think that, I, I do think that in time, you'll see more consumers uh, utilizing this market from a pricing or a risk management standpoint. So I do see volume and open interest going up. I think it will take a little while to continue to move this thing up, but I do think it will happen. 
I think the commercial who has uh, historically not managed their risk are beginning to find out there is significant risk in these markets. And um, if we don't manage that risk, uh, then our profits are going to shrink or we might not even be around. So that's the reality of the situation, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. And I, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because I think that that same story is playing out across other, you know, secondary commodities or whatever you might term them, even though rice has this sort of unique position in being you know, the second most important commodity where, you know, we've gone through a long period of stability and a lot of people have sort of disbanded or not invested in risk management teams. And suddenly this wave of volatility has returned. And actually, when you when you look at the macro picture, it doesn't look like it's going to go away anytime soon with a more volatile environment, with, with deglobalization, I keep saying it, the, these, all these trends playing in. But actually, we're seeing right across the board, whether it's you know, various vegetable oils or all the way through to sort of more esoteric products from the, the crude barrel, that risk management is is crucial, and we you know we saw in Europe last year major major firms needing government bailouts because they just didn't have the right risk management in place. So I, I, I certainly echo there, Lewis, what you're saying that obviously that's a a crucial component for any any person in the value chain and commodities to make sure they've got their their hands around and are, and are managing it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think your synopsis is is right on there, Paul. What you're what you're saying, and we're seeing that. In other markets, you kind of alluded to what's going on in veg oil and what we're seeing with renewable diesel and SAF, which will be coming on there, and what that's doing. If there's any question in your mind what it's done to veg oil prices, go to the grocery store and buy a half gallon of uh, bean oil and see what it is today and just wait and see what it's going to be a year from now. If we continue to, to burn that, uh, prices will continue to go up. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, it's been a, a real pleasure having you on. I will obviously put links to Hilltop Securities on the show notes so people can find you. And, uh, you know, I do really look forward to having you on in a, a year or two's time and, and get an update on where rice is. I personally find it really fascinating doing a, a deep dive into the market. Well, thank you very much, Paul. I've enjoyed it tremendously. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and HC Group, a search and advisory firm dedicated to the commodity markets, visit our website at www.hcgroup.global. There you can find out more about our services and our offices around the world. There you can also find more content from interviews to insight pieces to more podcasts focused on the commodity value chains. Thanks again for listening.